All right, good afternoon, everybody. Um, can ever, I assume you all can hear me okay? Thanks. Um, <clears throat> my uh, voice is going a little bit, but I think it'll last another 30 minutes. Um, I'm Cody Benkelman, I'm a product manager for imagery, and uh, Randall Rebello is here with me. We couldn't decide how to split this up, so I'm pretty much gonna do the whole presentation, but I've asked Randall to just make sure I don't skip anything and, and or misrepresent something. <clears throat> um, and let me go ahead and get started. So this is about um, optimizing image management and image services in the ArcGIS, in the cloud. Um, I've got an outline after a couple slides. The, uh, the basic objectives, I think, are fairly straightforward. If you're sitting here, I assume these are fairly obvious. Um, is there anybody here who's not currently using the cloud? Okay, so maybe, maybe a little bit of uh, background there. Um, there are certainly some advantages. You can store a lot of data volume in the cloud, and imagery, of course, has historically got a lot of data, or classically has a lot of data. You've also got the elastic computing, the elasticity, elasticity of the cloud to increase your computing power if you need it. Um, but again, imagery is somewhat unique in the fact that we've got such large data volumes. So that's one of the reasons for, for moving to the cloud. Um, <clears throat> some of the advantages, again, you've got lower cost and more resilient storage. Um, it's simpler in, in setting up an enterprise computing environment. And the scalability, the fourth bullet there, is really one of the keys. Um, you do have some issues or some, some disadvantages to deal with. You've got to get data into the cloud in the first place. The second bullet on the bottom is, is one of the key things I'll talk about. There are many different storage configurations, and that's part of what I want to focus on. Um, infrastructure changes, of course, things are changing all the time. Uh, and I'm most familiar with Amazon, but everything I'm showing here also is applicable to Azure and the Google Cloud, and I believe um, Alibaba, thank you. <clears throat> so, and the one at the bottom, the complex data access policies, I really won't have time to discuss, but I do have slides. So if you get the slides from us, or from me, there are slides here, and I'll try and show you very briefly, but I won't have time to go over them. Um, so I wanted to stop at the outline and just let you know, I, um, I wanna talk about the data storage options in the cloud. I'm really gonna focus on bullets one and two. Once you've got data in the cloud, how do you access it with ArcGIS Image Server? The architectures and the data model for scalability are some additional resources. And again, if we had an hour or 90 minutes, we could go through more detail. I've got slides on that, but I don't know that we'll get to it. Um, and I really should have added security as a fifth issue same, same issue, there are slides in this slide deck that I'll give to you, but I'm not the expert on some of these things, um, so I'm really not the best one to address it. <clears throat> so I know, uh, I know we, we want to encourage you to do the survey, and if your survey says he went over too much material too quickly, I will understand, I'll admit up front that's where, where we're gonna go. Um, but let me go ahead and talk a little bit about data storage configurations. And again, I'll be brief with this because I assume that most of you already know this. The, on the left, standalone disk access or direct access is where you've got a computer connected directly to the disk. The one in the middle, NAS, is network attached storage where you've got disks on a network and you're accessing the data through the network. Uh, and this, again, makes sense for an enterprise or an in-office configuration. But when we get to the cloud, the real scalable storage in, in, the, uh, in the case of Amazon is typically called S3, which stands for simple scalable storage. And that's where you actually get to the lowest cost and the best scalability. <clears throat> but there are some issues with trying to access data from that storage, and that's part of what we're gonna focus on. Um, there's some uh, figures here that talk about costs, and I'm not sure these are all accurate today. Some of these slides are a, are a year or two old. I did try and update these, so I think the two on the left, actually, I think these, I think these the cost figures are correct, um, but part of what I wanted to, or part of what we're showing here is with, a, with an instance, and again, this is Amazon specific, you do get automatically, they automatically give you instant storage, which is directly attached to the server. 
the, uh, <clears throat> what is referred to in Amazon as EBS, elastic block storage, are disks that you can attach and detach from servers, but multiple servers can't share the same disk. It's one, one, one server only for any of the disks, and so that's one of the challenges with using the EBS drives. If we can get to the S3 storage, we can now have one, multiple servers hitting the same data. And if you're going to be doing anything with scalability where you've got to add more servers, if you've got a spike in demand, <clears throat> this is one of the advantages of the cloud is you can replicate your servers, but if you can't instantly access the data storage, then the, that elasticity, that scalability doesn't work as well. So again, that's one of the things that we're talking about here is how to make that work. Um, let's see, is there anything else there? I guess there are some cost figures, but the, the key is with S in Amazon, S3 is, is the least expensive the, of those options. There's yet another storage option called Glacier that really does not play into this uh, scenario because we can't access Glacier directly. Uh, and this is simply to acknowledge that we're not Amazon only. This does work in Azure, but some of the terminology is slightly different. But it really is fundamentally the same concept. <clears throat> so if you are using data and accessing from the S3 or that scalable storage, we really want to minimize the number of requests and the number of times we go out to disk. And this, this is kind of a personal message or this is a lesson we had to learn within ArcGIS because up until the cloud became a reality, everything in ArcGIS assumed you had local storage and we didn't focus on minimizing the number of requests or the size of requests or minimizing those repeat requests. When we moved to the cloud, if you've got some latency between your server and the storage, these are some of the issues we have to look at to make sure that it's efficient enough to actually work for your end users. Uh, so by using uh, this, by, by enabling access to S, directly connect to the S3 simple storage, we can enable that elasticity and then we have to, we have to address the caching issue um, and I'll come back to, I'll come back to caching. <clears throat> I guess just one, this is just one detail and again I, I know this is going to be too much material too quickly but if you want to come back to any of these topics, We'll be in the imagery island today and tomorrow, and you'll feel free to con contact us over the web or over email. Um, when we do configure our S3 access on the, the bullet in the middle, minimizing repeat requests, what we want to do is anytime an image is accessed, we make a local cache of the imagery that we just looked at, and that cache ideally will go to that free instant storage because that's the fastest storage you've got access to on an Amazon instance. Anyway, that's kind of a detail on this slide down in the, out in the weeds as we say, but if that's not clear, uh, by the end of the presentation let me know, we can talk further. So one of the issues to look at when you're storing imagery in the cloud is the format you're using. And on the left, we've basically listed those that we do not recommend. Um, again, I'm not here to criticize any different formats or any technologies, but a raw striped TIFF format is not as rapid to access, and I'll, and I'll touch on this a little bit more. JPEG 2000 in particular has some efficiency problems. In most cases, we, we don't necessarily recommend you reformat your data, but in the case of JPEG 2000, sometimes that does become necessary. Tiled GeoTIFF is an improvement over the other two, but again, it was not intended for cloud storage, so on the right-hand side, there are two formats that we are recommending, and that's really where I wanna focus. Uh, the MRF, that stands for Meta Raster Format. This was actually developed by NASA JPL, so it's not an ESRI format, it's, uh, it was developed at NASA, and I'll come back to, to, to more detail on that. Um, it is tiled, the, the raster itself internally is tiled, so you can access randomly as necessary. Um, and you have multiple compression formats. Uh, the lurk on the in the middle right is something that Esri has developed but released into the public domain. So it is an Esri format or, or an Esri compression type that's understood by ArcGIS, but it, it's not proprietary, it's, it's, it's uh, open. Um, and I'll come back to the rest of, 
MRF, although I think that may be all we say about Lurk. Do you remember? Okay. Um, then on the bottom right is Cloud Optimized GeoTIFF. Is there anybody here using that now? Okay, it's a relatively new format. Uh, it's fundamentally very, very similar to GeoTIFF, but it has a couple of differences to make it more efficient for cloud access. And, and we say it there on the right, the pyramids are up front, but I've got a graphic that shows that. Um, so again, the part of the issue here is um, a striped TIFF file is, is not written in a tiled format, so internal to the file. If you want to get to some of the last data, you've got to skip over all the, the prior data to read through it. It can be inefficient to get the pixels out. What we recommend is an internally tiled TIFF file. So no matter how big the area is or number of pixels, internal to the file, there are tiles. And that allows you faster access to randomly grab any area out of that tile or out of that file. The cloud-optimized GeoTIFF, the, the fundamental difference is the pyramids are at the front of the file. So if you're creating a reduced resolution view, you don't have to skip over all the data in the file to find the pyramids. They're written up front. Uh, so that's one of the fundamental differences that was implemented in what's called cloud-optimized GeoTIFF. Other than that, it's for the most part the same. I believe it's the same as a GeoTIFF. Honestly, I'm not an expert. There may be subtle other differences and you guys using it may be able to help clarify that. <clears throat> what I do want to talk about is the, uh, the meta raster format. Again, this is something we've used a great deal at Esri, so not to say it's absolutely the best or it's the only game in town, but we've used it a lot and it does work very well. The key with the MRF format is we've separated the pixels from the metadata that you need to access. So if you're roaming around a map, what you need is an index that tells you which files you're roaming onto, which files are going to contribute imagery to the current view. And those are in very, very small files stored separately from the pixels in the, in the MRF format. Uh, the pyramids are also stored separately. So depending on what the server is doing, if it's looking for the pixels versus looking for the metadata about the image, it's looking to different files. And the key is, on the far right, we cache locally. Anytime you're using these MRF files in image server, if they're in S3 storage, we, anytime we hit a file, we download those very small metadata files and keep a local cache so we can very quickly reach the index that tells you which images go where and the metadata for those files. But the pixels, we only read on demand. We only read the pixels from the S3 storage when we need those pixels to put them into the display. And I hope that's clear. Um, let's see, I think most of this I've already gone over. Uh, it, this is open source, it was implemented in GDAL uh, 2.1 and later, so GDAL is built into ArcGIS. But again, this is not proprietary to ArcGIS, so other software can use the MRF format. Um, I touched on the compression options, but I don't, I don't want to go in more detail there. Um, and there are, so, the, the, the point at the bottom about multiple implementation modes, I can give you some examples, but I don't want to take time for that right now. Again, if you want to talk about some different configuration options, please come by the, uh, the exhibit booth. Oh, and then the bottom right, there's a URL if you want to read about the MRF format. Um, and, and we can get you all of these short URLs again later if you need those. <clears throat> okay, so that was a bit of discussion of the different formats and maybe some pros and cons of using different image formats. Once we've decided we're ready to move data to the cloud, how do we go about doing it? The first line talks about public, you know, publicly available tools, AWS command line, cl I use Cloudberry a lot. If you're dealing with very, very large data collections, uh, hundreds of gigabytes or terabytes or more, it's actually more efficient to simply ship a hard drive to the cloud provider and they'll mount it and you can copy your data that way. What I want to focus on is the third bullet where we've got a couple of tools. Again, if you're dealing with terabytes, you probably don't want to do this, but for gigabytes, we've got a couple of tools that you can do your own upload to the cloud. Would you keep an eye on my time for me, please? Thanks. Um, so. And then that last bullet, 
we debated the, the second of the or the second to the last bullet run optimized rasters if your files are already in the cloud we're kind of mixing stories this slide is about copying to the cloud optimized rasters is talking about formatting and so we're we're mixing two stories again i apologize if that's not clear but i'll come back to optimized rasters in a moment um, so this is a tool available in uh for download from our imagery workflows site. Um, oh, I'm sorry, from GitHub, thank you. Um, and I know that's a lot of text. I was gonna try and take some of this text off the slide, but really all of this is fairly important. A couple of specifics about optimized rasters. It will reformat your data. So if you choose to use MRF or, or the cloud optimized GeoTIFF, optimized rasters will, write, will read you any GDAL format or nearly any and write out that optimized format, it will also simultaneously copy up to the cloud for you. So this is kind of a dual purpose tool. You can use it to convert formats and use those locally. You can use this to copy data to the cloud or you can do both at the same time. Um, right in the middle, another very important point is you don't have to have ArcGIS installed. So if you're going to be moving data to the cloud, you don't have to be at ArcGIS Pro, this will run without ArcGIS. Um, the logging support, if your transfer gets interrupted, it'll, the system knows where it was interrupted and it can pick up and continue your data copy. Um, and again, some of those details, if you, want, if you see anything there you want to ask about, let me know, otherwise I'm gonna go ahead and move on. Um, <clears throat> so optimized rasters, again, has been around for a couple of years and you have to download that from our GitHub site. We've got a lot of experience with it, so it's, it's well proven, but it's not built into ArcGIS. So as of Pro 2.3 and, and uh, ArcMap 10.7 and Server 10.7, which is coming out this month, we have a, a different route to some of these same concepts. One is the cloud storage connection, and that's how you access data after it's in the cloud. The second one, transfer files, is the name of a GP tool that you can use to copy your data up to the cloud. But unlike optimized rasters, uh, this transfer files tool does not do the reformatting. So if you want to use that MRF format, you should use optimized rasters first. You can then decide if you want to copy through optimized rasters or use this. Um, and this does support multiple clouds. Again, we showed Amazon on the screen, but supports multiple cloud architecture. The access key? No, yeah, this? No, no, right, right. And we, it's listing uh, the various cloud providers there. Okay, so that's getting data into the cloud. Now, if you've got data in cloud storage, how do you use that? What do you, what do, you do? And we've, again, we've got a couple of different stories here. One is raster proxies, the other is cloud connections. Um, and if I just kind of go back, the cloud connection is new and built into ArcGIS Pro 2.3. So, so once again, I'm, I'm acknowledging I've got two different stories here, raster proxies and cloud connections, but I'll try and make it clear when you may want to use one or the other. They're, they're, not, they're not equivalent, but they're two different ways to approach the same. So what a raster proxy is, is if you go back to that MRF format, if you've got data sitting in the cloud, the raster proxy is a very small file sitting on your server that masquerades as the full size image. And then when ArcGIS wants the pixels, that raster proxy knows how to go out to S3 and get the pixels. Um, so again, this has been available since 10.5. Uh, there, there's a kind of a, a sysadmin detail there. You've got to have Boto3 installed and I think that's about it. Again, I'll, I'll talk more about the proxies. The alternative method is to use that cloud connection which is built into ArcGIS uh, Pro 2.3 and beyond. <coughs> so again, the way the raster proxies work is for every file that you've got in your mosaic data set that you want to serve, you'll have a local copy called a raster proxy. But if you've got, if you're accessing terabytes of data, your raster proxies are only going to consume a few megabytes of space. They're very, very small. Um, 
again, it's most optimum when, at, when referencing that MRF format, but it's not necessary to use the MRF format. You can still use the cloud optimized GeoTIFF or you can continue to use TIFF files or other formats if desired. In general, I would still rec I would recommend in most cases to use the MRF format if you can. Um, if you've, there, there's a bullet in the middle, can have any raster extension. By default, an MRF file will be called .MRF. But if you've got an ex entire existing configuration that you're trying to migrate and it's already referencing thousands of TIFF files, you can create raster proxies with the TIFF extension so your system believes it's still looking at all the same files. You won't have to rebuild that system. You're simply going to move your storage off the more expensive block storage onto Amazon S3. And I'm seeing some confused looks. Again, I'm, we're trying to cover a lot of material in 30 minutes, so, um, so forgive me if that's not entirely clear. Uh, let's see. There are a couple of bullets there about the cache. Now, if you're going to use this method and, and download pixels on demand, you've got to have a local cache or you want to have a local cache to store those pixels. If you pan away from an area and come back to the same area, you don't want to go back to S3. You want to use a local cache. But at some point, you're going to have a limit to how big that cache is and you'll need to do some cache management to make sure and clear that out. So the optimized rasters download has information in there about managing that cache file. Um, okay, so that's probably enough on that. <coughs> so the alternative method, if you're not going to use raster proxies, again, this is new at Pro 2.3, we have what we now call the ArcGIS clouds, uh, cloud storage, ACS file. And what we do is basically provide a link from your ArcGIS catalog into your cloud storage bucket. And that appears as an ACS file. And then I believe, I, I actually did not. I should have put that. What, the, uh, the third bullet, it's access files directly using a local file path. What that path will look like is your C drive, whatever directory name, and then in the middle of the path, it'll be um, file name or uh, connection name dot ACS. So that ACS file will be part of the path, and then it will appear from that point down to be a, a folder structure and a, and a direct link to your, to your files. So you can make this cloud connection and then put those, and then navigate through catalog to find your images, put them into your mosaic data set, and so the path will just have that, that ACS connection in it, but it's basically a, a, a link to your cloud storage. <clears throat> One other point, I just put this bullet on the slide. Um, Again, I don't mean to wave my hands about too many configurations, but one way of using either of these technologies is to author your Mosaic data set locally, make sure all of your data is working, and then copy your Mosaic data set up to the cloud where you've got your data stored or you're going to copy your data, and, and then it will work in the cloud. And so the point of that last bullet is if I've got ArcGIS on my computer and files in the cloud, you can use raster proxies to access them, or you can use ACS connection to access data in the cloud. But if you're going from an office to the cloud, you're going to have bandwidth limitations. It's really not designed to use operationally in that way. The idea is for these connections to be on a server in the cloud, sitting next to your S3 storage or your blob storage. So you can author it locally in your office, make sure it's working, and then copy it to the cloud. But you're going to be disappointed if you try and access a lot of data in your office from, a, from the cloud. So is that clear? Okay. <laughs> Seeing at least a few nod, a few yeses. Okay. So we just put this slide in. I guess one other note. I've given this presentation for the last couple of years, but I didn't talk about the, the cloud connections uh, or that transfer files GP tool because they're new. Now that I'm giving you two stories, I feel obligated to try and clarify when do I use cloud connection, when do I use the raster proxies. 
the, the, cl the cloud connections, one advantage is they are built into ArcGIS now. So I think moving forward, you're gonna see greater integration and, and more capabilities there. Uh, it's also a very simple way to use it. it. Once you make that cloud connection, it's just a, a virtual node and catalog, and from there you can navigate through your directory and, and see your files. Um, and this can also, if you're setting up a server where you've got to segment your data, the cloud connection can make it a little bit easier to say all of the data in this S3 bucket goes to this customer. I've got a different connection to data over there for another customer or project. It makes it a bit easier to seg segregate your data. On the proxy files side, you've really got a little bit more control over the configuration. If you've got multiple servers that need to hit uh, different, different data sets in the cloud, and you, you've either got proxy files on your system as separate files. You can also put proxy files into a mosaic data set. They can be literally embedded into the attribute table. And I know that's not, the difference isn't clear, but the bottom line is there are some configurations where you may want to change the structure of how your server and your data files are stored for scalability and efficiency. And the raster proxies give you more flexibility in how you store those separate files. So it's, it's more flexible, but with that flexibility, there's a potential for a bit more confusion about how do I set this up? How am I doing on time? Okay, five minutes, okay. Uh, okay, uh, one other thing, the, the raster proxies, well, on the left-hand side, if you're gonna use the cloud connection and then you load data from the cloud, ArcGIS will go through and look at each file to verify extents and number of pixels, et cetera. There's, currently no way to shortcut that process and that can be long, that can be lengthy. With the raster proxies, we can preload that those common, uh, common, uh, what did I call it? Attributes, thank you. Um, so you. So if you've got literally thousands or tens of thousands of files, the proxies can be faster to set up and reconfigure. Um, okay, I'm barely gonna make it. Okay, this is the part where you're probably gonna get angry at me, but these are not my slides. I really can't give you a lot of detail on these and we don't have time. But if you want to see different configurations, they'll be in the slides I can hand out and we can get people at the raster island to, to answer this. This is just simply to show you some example configurations. In this case, we're replicating a geodatabase across multiple servers for scalability, but we're actually making copies the fundamental difference here is we've got an enterprise geodatabase and multiple servers are connecting live to that geodatabase. So this is one configuration where you've got map server and image server on the same computer. If you need to scale up and you're using a lot of the S3 storage and you've got a separate image server, separate from your portal and uh, your map server or raster analytics or other servers, we've got other configurations here. And again, I apologize that I'm not the expert on this, but we can get the people to talk to you if you need this, and this will be available in the slides. And I'm gonna skip this completely, if you don't mind. I'll get it to you if anybody wants it. <clears throat> okay, this last 30 seconds, I assume is review for all of you. This is really an old story. This is nothing new. But if, if you haven't seen how we recommend scaling up Mosaic data sets and services, I don't want you to take off down the wrong path on this part of the design just to take advantage of the cloud storage. So again, I apologize for going through these quickly. I assume everybody knows the Mosaic data set. It's our model for scalability and accessing imagery. If you don't know the Mosaic data set, please let me know. Our fundamental recommendation is to manage every collection as a separate Mosaic data set. Every collection put it into its own mosaic and stop at that point and do QC, but we then can merge many mosaic data sets into one. And the key there is if you're familiar with the mosaic but you haven't done this, don't use the default raster type. Use the table raster type to put a mosaic into a mosaic. If you use the default raster type, you'll get into performance problems. Again, I know this is fast, but come see me if you wanna know more. The advantage of doing this is from that central repository, we can make an image service and share all of the data. And then if you add more data as a source mosaic, 
do your QC, merge it into the central derived collection, everything downstream is already set up and working. So that's the advantage for scalability. Again, this is, this is kind of an old story. I've been telling the same story for five years. So I know that was fast. I hope that's okay. Um, if you're looking for resources, I want to make sure you see this. The landing page for our imagery workflows uh, will get you to the, uh, our resource center. There are sample scripts here where you can download sample data and sample scripts and build workflows for multispectral satellite data, pre-processed orthos, elevation and LIDAR. There are different workflows in different settings, and we give you examples of all of that. Um, and I think that's, oh no, it's not all I had. There is a, the, the group is where you'll find the, um, the downloadable samples. So what have I got, am I over? <laughs> okay, <clears throat> okay, so there's nobody coming in after. I know you may wanna go to another session, but I admitted on my outline I should have had a fifth topic and that is security. There are numerous ways to address security. And this is one reason some organizations are not using the cloud. They don't trust whether or not people are gonna see their data sitting in Amazon S3. Again, I don't have time to go over all of these now, but we've got resources we can direct you to to implement different methods of security. The second one, um, Peter, I think Peter may have decided to label this himself, but he talks about using obfuscation. And all that really means is, in the middle of the path name, or in the, in, in the folder structure, if optimized rasters is copying data to the cloud, we can throw in a random string to make it impossible for anybody to, if they start to see where your files are stored, it'll make it impossible for them to guess what, where the rest of your files are. So it's not truly secure, these would be publicly shared files, but the reality is if you didn't know the exact path name to get to every file, there's no way you would find them but that still becomes a bit of a trust me card with regard to security. So anyway, that's what the obfuscation method is all about, and um, Optimized Rasters does support this. Again, if you wanna talk about security, I know I didn't give you enough detail, but we can talk about that at the booth. So I don't think we've got anybody following us. Again, I apologize for going so quickly, but I'm happy to get the slides out to anybody that needs them. Any questions at this point? Yes. You were talking about the proxy files. Right. Are they separate files for the part of the No, the, so the question is the proxy files, they are separate. Well, I'm sorry. I, I actually get confused about this myself. Um, the proxy files are essentially local copies that point to, uh, point to your files in the cloud storage. Let me get back to that screen. Go ahead. Uh, switch on top. I'll let Randall answer. Can you hear me? Oh, okay. So basically proxy files, you can think of it as a link to your image. So it's, it's a very small um, XML file basically, but it can have the same file extension as uh, your imagery or your raster data set. So if you've got a, a TIFF file, you can have your proxy file also called .tiff, but essentially it's just a very small XML file and it's got a, a node in there which says source and the source points to your S3, the, the actual file on the S3 bucket. So, but, so when ArcGIS is reading it, um, it sees it as a TIFF file Internally, it then realizes it's not a TIFF file, and it passes it on to GDAL. GDAL then gets the source and brings all the relevant pixels down to your local machine. So that's what it is. The, the part I can't remember is, if I've got a proxy for a TIFF file, is it one single file, or do I have the index as a separate file sitting next to the proxy? No. Uh, no, you don't have the index sitting. Um, or is that inside? Yeah, you do have the index sitting as well. Okay. Right. So there so would be multiple, file. for one single TIFF file in your local proxy file, there would be multiple files. But again, these are kilobytes in size. They're very tiny. So <clears throat> anyway, other, any other questions? All right. Please fill out the survey. If you loved it, my name is Cody. If you hated it, um, I'm, I'm Elon Musk. <laughs>
Oh, and it's first initial, last name if you want to email us. Um, I'll put my name back on screen.